alle cross. Grazie. Allora, buonasera a tutti. Eh, devo cominciare all'inizio di dire, mi dispiace di non parlare in italiano, Ero, ho abitato qui a Roma eh, con i nonni, con, quando mio nonno ha lavorato all'ambasciata americana, ma 35 anni fa. Eh, ero studente all'Università di Bologna per un anno, ma 25 anni fa, e ho dimenticato troppo, in, in, in un, cost, eh, un contesto formale così, meglio se parlo in inglese non sbaglio, ma quindi uh, ho fatto... <ride> Ma tutti gli americani parlano in italiano? Eh? Ah. No, ho fatto una corsa questa mattina. I was going for a run this morning on the Tiber. And I was running, you know how there's the little footpath below the, below the street? You know it? So I was running it, and I, at the end of my run, I was going up the stairs, and I stopped and I looked at the street sign. And it said, Via Enrico Fermi. And I thought that was appropriate in the context of today's discussion. The geopolitics of technology and of science. I would challenge any of you to give me a name from the 20th century of a scientist whose work had more to do with geopolitics than Enrico Fermi and the creation of the nuclear age. And it's interesting to me to listen to the president of Armenia, an astrophysicist. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States, we do not have an astrophysicist as our president. <laughs> he brought up two things. He brought up Roosevelt's use of the radio, Marconi. He brought up a revolution that took place in his country, in Armenia, using the cell phone. Raise your hand if you own a cell phone, a mobile phone. Raise your hand. Tutti. Every single one of those has something inside that if you take it out, it doesn't work. Non funzione. A battery. A product of a man, a foundational named Alessandro Volta. Italians have always been uh, people, something in their character to imagine and invent the future. Uh, there's a gentleman here uh, who's one of the authors of this report who will be speaking this afternoon, Professore Vincentelli uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. And he's created not one but two companies whose, based on his research, have created billions of dollars of value. Miliardi non milioni. Uh, so there is something in the character of Italians that enable for innovation, for imagining and inventing the future. Uh, but it's been a difficult last 25 years, I think. This process of digitization, of mass digitization, is really a phenomenon of 25 years. 1993 to today is 2018. And I think, to speak frankly, it's been difficult 25 years for Italy. And all of these changes have happened very quickly. I have three little children. They're 16, they're 13, and they're 11 years old. And I was explaining to my children that when I went to l'Università di Bologna, I had a girlfriend. And we loved each other like only kids in university can love each other. But we didn't have email, and we didn't have text messages. And to make a phone call cost a dollar a minute. You remember those days? You remember? And so we engaged in a very old, almost tribal form of communication. We had this stuff, it was called paper. And we wrote on the paper. And we put it in an envelope and we sent it in the mail. And my kids think this is remarkable. They asked if there were also dinosaurs in Italy when we did this. <laughs> All these changes of products of the last 25 years and we understand this process of digitization has contributed both positively and negatively to the world. And my perspective at looking at this is somebody who's sort of grown up and been not just an analyst, but also an actor in the geopolitics of digital. I was an entrepreneur, and when I was an entrepreneur, I got to know Barack Obama. And when he ran for president, he said, we're going to have to run against people like Hillary Clinton and like John McCain, who are much better known and who are very powerful. 
We have to innovate as we run for, as we run for president. So I ran technology policy for that presidential campaign. And that campaign for me was early evidence of how social media, of how email, of how cell phones can be used to change the flow of power. And we did this for two years, and we came out of that having, believing that technology was a great enabler of democracy, that it was something that enabled participation, it enabled the flow of information and communications. But then I went to work for Obama when he was president. And working for Obama, I saw that these technologies uh, are value neutral. They take on the values and intentions of the people that use them. It's not automatically democratizing. And in fact, it can be used to great peril. One of the projects that I worked on uh, was in Syria, where what we learned was that the Syrian government uh, was able to find people through the GPS on their mobile phone, figure out who they were, and then assassinate them, based entirely on the GPS on their mobile phone. We saw in the Arab revolutions that these technologies make it much, make it easy to start a revolution, but it does not make it easy to govern. And as I think about all that digitization has done geopolitically from 1993 to 2018, I don't think the pace of change is going to stop. And I think that it is not sufficient to just understand the impact of digitization geopolitically in terms of information communication services, but also to think about what's to come. We've seen some data about We've seen some information about data creation. And by way of illustration, 90% of the world's data has been produced in the last two years. 90% of the world's information has been produced since November of 2016. And there are various estimates, lots of different studies suggest different numbers, but most estimates have the number of digital, of, of digital devices right now somewhere around 20 billion. These are our laptops, our smartphones, the sensors in our supply chains. In three years, that number is going to go from about tw 20 billion to 45 billion. So we are living right now as the slope on the graph is going up. And the industries that are going to be most transformed during this time are not just things about information communication services, but it's what we might think of as the older industries, mining agriculture, transportation, because what we're going to be doing is we are running the zeros and ones of computer code into more and more objects. And we are creating powerful artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics. And the interesting challenge for geopolitics for the road forward is really going to be who sets the rules. During the last 25 years, most of the rules have been set in the United States because so much of the wealth creation came from Silicon Valley and came from Washington State. But right now, we have some more global competition. Right now, it's really the United States and China. China is not willing to accept an American model of governance in a digital world. In the United States, as we know, it's really the companies that set the rules. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, these companies have more power than governments setting global digital policy. China is not willing to live with this. They say, no, we are going to set the rules from the state. The government will set the rules. So right now, we are beginning to see a very powerful conflict between the American model driven by companies and the Chinese model driven by the state. And the question is, where is Europe? Will Europe step forward with its own perspective and its own values? And I think that there is an interesting middle road that is not just the authoritarian state 
of China, and it is not just the billionaires in Silicon Valley, but there is a model, and, Mac and interestingly, uh, Macron two days ago suggested this, that said, no, it needs to be a partnership between government, between the private sector, and between civil society as we set the rules for the road for future technologies. The way I think about it, I agree with the president. This is not industry 4.0. This is an entirely new sea change. And the way that I think about it is land was the raw material of the, industri of the, of the agricultural age. Iron was the raw material of the industrial age and data is the raw material of the information age. And how you governed the land during the agricultural age was of enormous consequence. The choices you made about how to re regulate land and land ownership. In the industrial age, how you regulate industry, do you regulate industry, what are the rules, the environmental rules, the labor rules, it was of great consequence. And so the challenge now in the geopolitics of digital is how do you regulate or not regulate data? And we don't want to leave it to the states. We don't want to leave it, lead it to entirely to the companies. And we certainly don't want to lead it just as a sort of chaotic environment of the Wild West, where anybody with a laptop can play by their own rules. One thing that I will say is that as these innovations take place, a lot of it will come from R&D in the military space. And it's important to recognize that R&D that commercializes in the military space oftentimes has dual uses. People forget the internet itself was initially a government project. And a powerful example of this I saw when I was in New Zealand. I was in the North Island of New Zealand in a place called Manawatu Wengui. They only have 82,000 people, but they have millions of cows. And when I was in the North Island of in New Zealand, I saw a powerful application that combined two military technologies, technologies that began military, GPS and laser technology. And because they commercialized, government subsidized uh, the creation of these technologies and then commercialized them for wider use, what I saw was a partnership between a local software company, the farming community, and a local university to create something called Pasture Meter, which basically enabled farmers with great big thick calluses on their hands who have thousands of heads of, of cattle to more efficiently manage their farms. So much so that they attribute this technology uh, to a 498% increase of beef exports to China. What I would say by way of conclusion for Italy, the country of Enrico Fermi, of Alessandro, Volt, uh, uh, Alessandro Volta, of so many people who imagine and invent the future, it is time to get over our 25-year slumber. It is really adapt or perish. You need some courage, coraggio. We need to fix the numbers that we saw in some of the earlier slides about the lack of people who are going into graduate technical programs. We need to make sure that our young people in our educational systems are producing people so that the outputs of our education system are mapping the inputs of private sector hiring because computer code is the alphabet that much of the future will be written in. And so what I think is if there is something very distinct about the culture of the Italian people where it's proficiency, brilliance in things that are scientific and, 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 scientific and technical in nature combined with a sensibility of the humanities that if brought together, instead of being more of an observer as it has been over the last 25 years, it can be a rule setter and an innovator for the next 10 years. Grazie mille.